Uh, we're we're uh, going through um, a series called Ecclesia, for those of you that are new here. Uh, the basic premise is the word Ecclesia means assembly, gathering, and it's meant to be a movement. Can everybody say movement? <laughs> movement, right? And a a along the way, uh, there were different groups of people, like the Romans started to call the assembly the ecclesia, they started to call it the basilica, and then from there, uh, the Germans got in there, and they call it like the kirch, and then ultimately that's where we get church from. And the difference is, is that this all happened when Christianity became legalized. And when it became legalized, it was in danger of becoming just a local establishment that's no longer on the move. And it was in danger of becoming an institution. And we see like everything that's happened, you know, since the early church began, you have multiple denominations and it just seems like one denomination is not uh, as friendly to another denomination. And anyway, you get my story, but God's people are meant to be together, not meant to be divided. You know who does the dividing? is the enemy. Yes, the enemy does the dividing. So anyway, today we're going to be looking at um, the church of Ephesus. And for those of you who uh, understand that there's a book in the Bible called Ephesians, well, one of the things that I'm trying to do today is just, just uh, to paint the picture of this church, the, the early story, the backstory of the church. And it might help us to understand some of the things that are said in the book of Ephesians. So with that said, I'm doing a series called The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, Ecclesia, right? And I don't say ugly, I say ugly, okay? So we start off always with the good, with the positive, and for the church of Ecclesia, you just gotta hang with me because it was a different kind of church. The good is that the gospel overcomes darkness. Now, what do you think about when I say darkness? I'm saying basically what you can think about as being dark represented Ephesus. It was kind of like this epicenter. It was on the coast, and there were like there was a temple of Artemis that was there. It was revered. It was like 130 yards wide, and uh, it had like 127 pillars holding up the um, the ceiling. And it was this place that was uh, a place for shrine prostitution. And. Artemis was the fertility god. And so the depiction is this idea that somehow if you engage in some of the practices in the temple that uh, women are going to be fertile, your, your crops are going to be fertile. And so there was very much a superstitious thing that was going on there. So as we look at this, you know, I think it's important to just kind of read this and then we'll just we'll go from there. So this happens on Paul's third missionary journey, okay? How many did he take? Three. Three. This is his third one. And as he takes this third one, what I want you to notice is that Paul becomes seasoned. He's going he's gonna to basically do new methodology, new methods, uh, things that he's learned, okay? So it says here, it says, as he entered the synagogue which is what Paul always did when he ever went to a new city, because his heart was for the Jews to be first to hear the gospel. And he did it by reasoning through the scriptures. So he enters the synagogue, and for three months he speaks softly. No. He speaks boldly, right? Do you like bold people? Sometimes bold people can be overbearing, right? But sometimes you need to have that kind of temperament. And so for the Lord, when he's choosing who's going to be that person, it was Paul, right? So he, he goes to the synagogue for three months and he spoke boldly. Now, what's unique about this is Paul, whenever he went to the synagogue before, 
he would be there for either one Shabbat, one Saturday, or maybe three maximum. Note here, he's enduring, right? He is there for three months. And for three months, he is finding favor in the Jewish synagogue. He is finding favor with the Jewish believers. And he is boldly reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. How many people know that Jesus always talked about the kingdom of God? And how many people know that that's sometimes missing when we think about, you know, for example, salvation? We tend to think about it being upstairs. That's what I used to call God before I was a Christian, right? The man upstairs. Anyway, so uh, he was persuading them for three months. Things were going well. You had... Jews, and you had people that were Gentile, um, reverence of God. You had all kinds of different groups here. And he's being successful. But then what happens when you're successful? When you're successful, you always will face opposition. Okay? And so it says, but when some became stubborn. Nobody knows that what that means, right? Nobody here has ever been stubborn, have they? Right? It says, but when they became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil against the way before the congregation. Did you all know that they used to be called the way? Like, this was a movement, right? And I suspect, I can't prove this, but this is kind of something I suspect. They were named the way because Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me, right? And so I suspect they were known as the way because they were going to show people the way, the truth, and the life. So they spoke evil against him. Now, in previous situations, the Jews would drive Paul out to go somebody somewhere else but that's why I'm saying Paul was more seasoned. He was more prepared. He, he had a plan B. He anticipated that perhaps the Jewish people would persecute him again. But from his perspective, he's like, hey, at least I got three months. Three months is a long time for him to reason about Jesus. And what was plan B? It says... Then he withdrew from them. He withdrew from the Jews. He withdrew from the synagogue and then took the disciples with him. And this is important here. He was reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. Tyrannus was a teacher. He started his school in Ephesus. And if you look at your notes, I got, in mine I kind of tease you by there. You see there's a number three there at the end of Tyrannus. In, in the earliest manuscripts, it actually says, gives a time stamp that Paul would come here and basically for five hours, from 11 to 4, he would teach at this hall. And he would teach at this hall for how long? For two years. Two years he's preaching there. It says, this continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So let me tell you a little bit about the, the way that the workforce operated in Ephesus. In Ephesus, uh, because of the heat, they said that you would start your work like at 7 o'clock and you would go to 11. And then from 11 to 4 was known as a siesta. It was a time where you ate your meal and you rested and then you went back to work in the evening from like, you know, 4 to 11. And so Paul, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the wisdom said, you know what, I'm not going to have a siesta. I'm going to teach in this hall about Jesus. 
And he's teaching to a bunch of people that come from a dark place, a dark background, um, a place where people were struggling. And he relentlessly, he, he, he preaches there. What was Ephesus like? Ephesus was a place that was known as a cult city. It's a place where witchcraft was happening, magic was happening. It was a place where there was a lot of demonic activity. It was a place where people had strongholds in their life. That was the climate of Ephesus. It was a place where people just worshipped a false goddess and were into prostitution. So when you talk about a dark place, this was a dark place. And here's the interesting thing. Did you know, well, if you look at Acts 16, 6, uh, Paul was on his missionary journey, and he wanted to go to Asia, to, to minor Turkey, where this is at, to Asia Minor. But it says the Holy Spirit forbade him. He wasn't allowed to go. And thinking about it, in God's sovereign plan, he probably wasn't ready. He probably wasn't ready for the darkness that he was about to encounter. And so he ended up going to Macedonia and to Europe and to places like, um, you know, Corinth and, and Athens and Thessalonica. But the Lord had something for him on his third missionary journey. He was going to go back. You know, sometimes the Holy Spirit says no. But sometimes that no isn't forever. Sometimes no just means not at this moment. Not now. I am preparing you. I am preparing you so that when you do go there, you will be able to have the best success. Because sometimes as Christians, we just can't go from A to Z without preparation. So Paul was there, and he continued to be there um, for two years. Where it says, all of Asia. Understand that. All of Asia heard the word of God. There's a section in Acts chapter 20 when Paul is calling the elders of Ephesus and he tells them that he's going to be going to Jerusalem. And he says, I declare myself today innocent of the blood of man for I did not hesitate to declare the words of God. I went house to house. He went to this hall here for five hours a day, for two years. Do you know how much time he invested in trying to teach people about Christ? Man, for two years, five hours a day. So what would happen is Paul was a tent maker. So he most likely would work from 7 to 11 and then do the haul for five hours and then go back and finish his tent making industry because when he confronts the elders too he tells them that i worked my way i didn't ask for anything because paul was passionate that people would know the gospel and he looked at this climate that he was in and said <laughs> If there are people that need to know the gospel, it's the people that are living in darkness. What was the result? Extraordinary miracles. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them. 
and the evil spirits came out of them. Think about that for a second. He had handkerchiefs. He had aprons. And these people, they wanted them. Because what he was saying was a gospel that basically said, God loves you and wants to do a miracle in your life. Now let me give you a little background. Ephesus was a little booming ministry, right? It was a booming situation for uh, temple worship, uh, for Artemis, and so uh, they would make a lot of profit here. So some of the things they would do is um, they would make amulets and they would make bracelets and they would have certain kind of like trinkets that promised you power if you bought it for $19.99 plus shipping and handling. It's a true story. They made money. They used that religious practice, the false religious practice, to make money. And so God, in his sovereignty, said, you think your amulets and your bracelets are going to have power? There's no power in that. And so they listened to this man Paul preach, and they sought after his handkerchiefs and apron. Now, if you look at the Greek, one of the things that it says is that that, that word that's translated as handkerchiefs could potentially be linked to the Latin term of sweat cloths. So it's quite possible that because it was so hot over there that Paul would wipe his, his, his forehead and his face and they would take the sweat cloths. It's also quite possible that the, you know, the handkerchiefs and the aprons were not um, his sweat cloth or his, his tent making outfit, but it's also possible that that was the attire that he chose to dress to look appropriate to teach in that background. Whatever it was, people wanted them. And when they got them, God said, this is where the power lies. And the power is not in the handkerchief. It's not in the apron. It says, who was doing extraordinary miracles? God was doing extraordinary miracles. How was he doing it? by the hands of Paul. So much so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched his skin, these people would carry away to the sick and people that had diseases, and they would also be having evil spirits cast out of them. That's called power evangelism. You know, I think about that sometimes because I was listening to a, a preacher and he was saved and he was reading the Bible and he was reading about miracles. And so as he was going to his church, uh, after being there for a little bit, because he, he was really trying to suck up everything that the Word of God said, he goes up to his elders and he says, so when are we going to do the stuff? Stuff? Well, you know, in the Bible, it talks about miracles, and it talks about healings. Well, we don't do that stuff. That stopped after the first century. He said, but it doesn't say that in the Bible. Don't we need some of that to happen in our lives? And my answer is, is that a lot of times I don't think we see God move like he can because we spend too much time inside the building of the church instead of being a movement and going out there where the people are. Sometimes this is the extent of our spiritual life going to church on Sundays, hoping that the pastor has something 
and doesn't talk too long. And the reason why many struggle with that is because God has more for you to do. God has more for you to do. He doesn't just want you to just sit down. He doesn't want you just to say, okay, I'll see you next week. No, if we want to see the stuff, we got to be willing to be involved in people's lives that are out there, that are outside the church, and, and show the persistence that Paul had, who basically said, I'm taking a job as a teacher of Christian philosophy. I'm going to teach in this hall about Jesus, and I'm going to do it I'm going to do it for five to seven days a week, probably six days a week for him. And I'm going to exhaust myself making a living, but I don't want to compromise the opportunity to share the gospel. And that is when God blesses people. It's when he blesses people is when people are actually going out to the people and proclaiming God. And Paul didn't go alone. He had some people with him. He had Timothy with him. He had Luke with him. He had Silas with him. And sometimes that's what we need. Sometimes in the church we need to have a group of people to help us because it's scary. But man, the greatest miracle that you're ever going to see is not blind eyes being healed or deaf ears hearing. The greatest miracle is when people accept Jesus Christ in their life. Because that's a supernatural thing. I was listening to a story by um, a missionary in Mozambique, Africa, named Heidi Baker. And they asked her the question, because I guess she's seen a lot of miracles in her ministry. They said, what's the greatest miracle that you've ever seen? And she said, the greatest miracle that she's ever seen is what God had done in her heart. There was a terrorist organization in Africa that we don't know about, but somehow it's connected to ISIS, and they were going around the village where she lived, and they were beheading babies. And the pastor's baby, or not baby, but kid at four and a half years old was one of the victims that was beheaded. And uh, as she was living there and wrestling with these people and she said that she had a hatred in her heart for those people because of what they did. And the Lord told her, said, I want to give you the miracle of forgiveness. And she said, no. And she said she wrote a list of reasons why she shouldn't seek forgiveness or, or extend forgiveness to these people of all the pain of people losing their, ch their child, right? That's the, most that's the most precious possession. And finally, she got to a point where she said she was just broken, and she realized that God didn't care about her list. Because we're like that, right? We got reasons why we don't do things. You know, God doesn't care about that sometimes. And God gave her the ability to forgive along with the church and even the pastor that had his baby beheaded. In fact, they found so much favor over there that eventually they let them do a prison ministry to the, to the terrorists that were apprehended. And she would go on to say that the love in her heart for those former terrorists in prison, she looked at them like they were little children that were led astray by darkness. And she's seen people come to Jesus. God cares about our willingness to go out there and share the gospel with people. If you really want to see God move, don't just listen to some pastor or theologian that says, well, those gifts stopped in the first century when the apostles, you know, died out. I don't know about you today, but this world needs to see the stuff. God moving in our lives. And we have to learn how to have faith. But sometimes we have strongholds in our life. Strongholds that prevent us 
from being all that God wants us to be. Which brings us to point number two. The reality of strongholds. About this time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. Note, it doesn't just say we make money. We have our wealth, abundance. And you see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia. See, when Paul went to Ephesus, and he went to minor Asia, that's where these seven churches in Revelation were spawned. And so, not only was Ephesus hearing about this, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away great many people, saying that gods made with hands are no gods. You know, strongholds comes in all shapes and sizes. Basically, a stronghold is something in our lives that prevents us from growing spiritually into all God wants us to be. There's strongholds such as doubt, rejection, poor self-esteem, pride, stubbornness, a victim mentality, defeatism. And when they linger, for a long time, it becomes a stronghold that prevents us from growing into all God wants us to become. Strongholds. The most important thing, and this is going to be the main thing today, is that we evaluate our life, we, we think through our life, and be honest with ourselves, and ask ourselves, what are the strongholds in my life that's keeping me from being all that God wants us to be? Because when you frame it like that, here's the reality. Every Christian, every person has a stronghold that's keeping them from being all that God wants them to be. That's keeping them from going to a lecture hall for five hours a day, six days a week just because it's so important for people in a dark world, in a dark climate, to know Jesus. In the case of um, Demetrius, he wasn't a believer. But even non-believers have strongholds that prevent them from coming to know Jesus Christ. And the stronghold here was greed. He frames it. It says that when he gathered all together, all the workmen in similar trades, and he talked about that this business where we have our, 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 our wealth, he's not concerned about Artemis. He's concerned about what the business of Artemis brings to his table. He's not saying. He's focusing on the things they make. The, the silver and the metal idols that he makes. And it, it says here that he gathers all the tradespeople, all the people that make these idols, and he talks about that that's where they get their wealth. And he's saying that this Paul is persuading people to turn away from the gods made with our hands. And a great many people are doing that. And you know why? 
because they recognize that it's silly to think that a man-made idol is an actual god. And the people that were living in Ephesus, they listened to this man who for two years rented out a hall on his own dime to proclaim Jesus. Think about that. Goes on. Because this upsets Demetrius so bad. It says, he says, and there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, disrepute, and also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing. He doesn't really care about Artemis. He's framing this because what does he care about? What is his stronghold? It's greed. It's wealth. It's money. It's something that he's used to. And the thought of him not being used to it says, you know what? God isn't the priority in my life here. The priority in my life is making money. And when you talk money, men listen. It says when they heard this, they were what? Happy? They were enraged and they were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. What they really were crying out was, Great is the money we can make from our Artemis of the Ephesians. And so the city was filled with this confusion and they rushed together into the theater, right? So he's proclaiming this and saying, these men are, are saying that our, our crafts are not God's. And people are like confused. They don't know why they're going to the theater. They've just seen everybody running there. They hear about this, this, this outroaring that's going on. And it says, and they rushed into the theater and they were dragging with them Gaius and aristocrats, uh, Macedonians, they don't even live here, who were Paul's companions in travel. Because they couldn't find Paul. And they had a meeting eventually, and the city clerk said, you know what, I don't see these people talking bad about Artemis. And so Demetrius needs to go to the city courts and the civil courts but that's the bad, is that sometimes people can be so upset at the spread of the gospel that they are willing to promote riots, to lead people into confusion. And at the core level is this stronghold of greed that's in their life. They, they, they prioritize it. Prioritize it ahead of God. So, ultimately, this riot lasted for two hours of people yelling, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is the occult. Great is the darkness. Have you ever observed Christians that don't seem to grow in their faith? They're at the same level, maybe, year after year, sometimes decade after decade. They don't seem to grow. And I'm saying that the primary reason is because there's some kind of stronghold that's preventing us from being all that God wants us to be. And some of those strongholds are like fear. Fear of what's going to happen. Fear is, is disconnected from God. Fear is not something that God wants us. He says over and over in scripture, he says, do not fear. He told Paul in Corinth, 
Do not be afraid. Some people don't think that they're good communicators. Some people think, you know, I'm okay. Some people have doubt. They doubt their ability to share. Some people have pride. Well, my job is to teach, not to go out there and be a missionary. Sometimes Christians have greed. And they spend their time prioritizing money over their relationship with God and just what they do. We all have strongholds. Some people are stubborn. And stubbornness is keeping them from being all that God wants. Some people are angry. And it's the same thing. Strongholds. We'll talk about that again, but it's important to know what is keeping me from becoming all that God wants me to be. And finally, we're going to get to the ugly. A demonic presence. A demonic presence. Some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of Jesus over the people who had evil spirits. This is quite funny to me, actually. It's, it's sad, but it's funny. Saying, now, now check this out. I adjure you by the name of Jesus whom Paul proclaims. What's wrong with that? There's no in the name of Jesus, right? Oh, yeah. The, we've seen these guys cast out demons. We've seen them have aprons that cast out demons. So you know what's happening here? In, in, in this time, there were Jewish itinerant exorcists. And they took advantage of this dark region here, and they would often, they had a ministry of basically taking people and casting out demons. But they did it for a cost, right? They did it for a charge, right? And so uh, it's also been said that, let me, let me just uh, read this to make sure that I get this correct. Um, it, it also says that uh, when it comes to exorcism, um, it's commonly believed that the Jewish priests had access to the secret name of God of Israel, and its pronunciation, and thus had special power over the spirit world. That they could even name the various spirits, the ones that are the most difficult. And so when they heard that these men were casting out demons in the name of Jesus, they simply concluded, why not add another name to our list? The problem is they didn't know Jesus. The problem is they didn't want to know Jesus. They just wanted to get paid. It says, and I love this too, it's, it's sad, but I love it. The, the evil spirit talks to them, okay? But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize. But who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, <laughs> mastered all seven of them, overpowered them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Man. You see, God is on the God is on a mission here. He wants this city to know Jesus. He doesn't want people to pretend they know Jesus or simply say something naive like, oh yeah, the, the Jesus that Paul mentions, I command you to get out. Now, Jesus wants us to know him. And by the way, he promises us that if we know him, that we have the ability to cast out 
demons in his name. But it's about relationship. It's also about faith and boldness because it's not easy to go to somebody that is possessed. It's scary for so, some of you that have never seen it or heard them talk. Oh my God, if you hear them talk, it's like screeching. Absolute hatred. Absolute disregard for the person that they're possessing. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all. And the name of Jesus was extolled. Sometimes Jesus uses bad situations like this, ugly situations like this, to accomplish his purposes. And in the process, as we look at the next verse, in, in the process here, what's happening is those that are now in fear and Jesus is praised now have some confession to do. It says here, and many of those were now believers. Let me read that again. Many of those were already believers, okay? Not a few, but many of those were all, the ones that were afraid, that feared this, right? And what did they do? They, they confessed and divulged their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts, been involved in the occult, been involved in witchcraft, brought their books together and they burned them in the sight of all. These are books that you have to look at or scrolls that are like magic potion kind of thing, magic spells kind of thing. These were believers. There were believers here that were still involved in the occult. Because when you grow up in that environment, when that's been all that you've known, some people still dabble in it. I was a custodian one time and working at a church, and I was upstairs, I was cleaning up all the seats over there, and there was a card, it's one of those cards you put in the offering, and there wasn't any offering in there, but there was a note to somebody that must have been sitting by them. And they said, I had my fortune read yesterday. What do you think about that? Oh, really? What did they say? In the church, watching the sermon, saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to take a break from whatever the pastor's saying or whatever song is singing, and I'm going to write a note to my friend. Guess what I did? I went to get... My fortune read. I had a, a fellow student when I was in the seminary. Uh, he went to this college called Reed College, which is known as an atheistic college. And he set up a little booth there, and he wrote on the booth, get your fortune read. And he said he had a long line of people. And so they would come up to him, and he would look at him, and he'd say, can I see your palm? And he, he looked at it, and it's like, yep, this is what it says. It says, if you don't know Jesus, you're going to go to hell. <laughs> he said his booth didn't last very long. <laughs> but the reality is, is that there are people that are into the occult that are Christians or that are in some area. Like, this was a stronghold. This was a stronghold here for these folks. But this casting out, or this, these demons that, you know, took advantage of this guy, it, it promoted fear, and it promoted confession and divulging their practices. And when it comes to a stronghold in our life, that is key for us, is to acknowledge it before the Lord, to confess it before the Lord, to repent before the Lord, so that God can take that and break it, right? Because there are so many people that have so much potential for Jesus, but the strongholds are keeping them back.
these folks were changed and they confessed and they divulged their secrets. And that is why, just the grand finale here, that is why when you read the book of Ephesians, you see a passage like this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand firm. What was going on in the church of Ephesus? There were people that were getting drunk. There were people that were slipping into sexual immorality, probably in the temple. There were people that weren't loving their wives lo or you know, loving their husbands. There were people that had relationships with their kids where they were emasculating them or angering them. There were people that were speaking to each other with unwholesome talk. There were people that were involved in drinking to get drunk. And that's why Paul says in that passage, do not get drunk on wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be addicted to God. Be addicted to what God has in your life. And so Paul knows this area. He knows this situation. He knows that there's principalities and there's authorities and there's cosmic powers. He knows that where he is in is a place of present darkness. But God prepared him for this journey and he had favor. And so just an ending. That's okay. Just an ending. You know, we figured that maybe Jesus was calling you. Say, hey, you got a stronghold in your life. <laughs> so, the reality of strongholds, they don't just pertain to the Christians, like I said, in Ephesus. Um, they pertain to us today. Strongholds that keep us from prevent, pre preventing us from becoming who God wants us to be. So I just encourage you today, be honest with yourself. Take a deep probe, a deep dive in your life. If you're having trouble identifying a stronghold, ask your spouse. They'll tell you. Ask a significant other, a trusted friend, a loving pastor. Keep in mind that the intention is not to shame you because you have a stronghold, because every one of us has strongholds in our life. But the intention is that Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will help you to conquer it. In the end, this takes honesty and the willingness for the sake of Jesus to be vulnerable. So I'm going to pray and then uh, John is going to come up here with his worship team and worship. But as, the, as it ends, I might just come up here and just make myself available to pray. Lord, I just thank you, God, for everybody here, God, everybody that might be listening online. I pray for those that are not here, God. I pray, Lord, that you help us to become all you want us to be, God. I pray, God, that you would reveal our strongholds, Lord. What is keeping us back, Lord? And I pray that you remove them, Lord, so that we can become all that you want us to be, God. Paul's stronghold at one point was fear. God said to him, you might not have told anybody, but I'm telling you right now, don't be afraid. I will be with you. I will protect you. There are people in this city that are my people already. And so as John Opus does worship, I'm just going to sit down right on the stage. And if you need prayer, 
I'm available. But I think this is a very important time to be honest with God so that we can, as a church, be the best church that God has intended us to become. Amen? Amen. Amen.